Hi everyone, uh, good morning. This is Kshitij from Shiksha.com and welcome to today's webinar uh, brought to you by Shiksha.com, uh, hosted and organized by Shiksha.com. The topic for today's webinar is ideal college selection strategy post lockdown stage. Now we have our experts with us today. Our experts include Dr. Vishal Talwar, Dr. Shivendra Mathur, Dr. Rekha Vij, and Mr. Sandeep Munjal. I'll give you a brief about our honorable experts today. Dr. Vishal Talwar, he is the Dean of School of Management, BML Munjal University. Prior to this, Dr. Talwar was the head of campus and assistant dean of SPGen School of Global Management, Dubai, Mumbai, Singapore, and Sydney campuses. Dr. Talwar had spent close to 12 years in the United Kingdom and returned to India in 2013 as Dean JRE School of Management and Educom and Raffles Joint Venture. Coming on to Dr. Shivendra Mathur. Dr. Shivendra Mathur is the registrar at NIIT University. Dr. Mathur is adjunct associate professor and has more than 11 years of experience in industry and academics. He has a rich exposure to startups and entrepreneurial finance. He has research inclination for public policy, e-governance, and areas in performance management. We also have the honor to have Dr. Rekha Vij with us today. She's the Deputy Dean of Academics at the North Cap University. She has been instrumental in shifting the teaching at NCU online overnight. She is also an Associate Professor at the Computer Science Department at North Cap University and involved in curriculum development in the department. We have our expert with us, Mr. Sandeep Munjal, who is currently the director at Vedatya Institute located in Delhi NCR. He also has more than 25 years of work experience with brands like the Taj Group of Hotels in India and Arama Corporation in the United States. He recently penned a book named The Indian Hospitality Industry Dynamics and Future Trends which has received splendid international response. I would now like to tell you and then take a few minutes to introduce Shiksha.com. Shiksha.com as a portal, I'll, I'll give you some stats for the last year, which is 1st April 2009, uh, 2019 till 31st of March 2020. Within this duration, Shiksha.com received more than 335 million page views, more than 71 million active students visited Shiksha.com. There were 140 million plus student visits and every student spent an average duration of two minutes and 20 seconds on the website in each visit. If I talk about our online presence, we have more than 30,000 plus colleges on our website with two lakh plus courses and a list of 600 plus entrance examinations to help you prepare. We receive a healthy traction on our platform because we host detailed and comprehensive information on both domestic and international institutions to enable the right college decision for students. Along with this, we also have tools like the college reviews. We have more than 1,75,000 college reviews on our website. We have the question and answer platform to answer your queries regarding higher education. We have ebooks and sample papers. We also have study abroad counseling service. We have colleges and rank predictors. We have college comparisons for, to, to, to make the choice easier for you. We have news and articles which give you regular updates on the higher education industry. And we have tools like Campus Connect, which help you connect with the colleges and universities to get a better idea and make a decision to get admission in the university or college that you dream of. Now, I would like to invite our first panelist, Dr. Vishal Talwar, to present his piece and educate students on how to make a good college decision in the time of this lockdown crisis. Dr. Vishal, uh, I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. If you can also uh, uh, you know, allow me screen share, that will be great, uh, Shitaj. Sure, sure. Just give me a moment, sir. Yes, sir. 
All right, great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, so very quickly, I just want to have an understanding from everyone here today. Um, if you can quickly maybe go across, uh, use your mobile phones, and after you use your mobile phones, if you can quickly tell me what your mood is at the moment. So you might have to just quickly go to menti.com, right? And once you go to menti.com on your mobile phones, if you're if you're watching it on a laptop, you might have to go to another screen. I just want to understand a bit of um, the mood at the moment. So you can uh, go to menti.com, uh, log in with that particular number that you see over there, 189746. I just want to have an understanding of what the mood is right now. How do you feel at the moment, you know, the midst of uh, this particular lockdown uh, situation, right? Just to get an understanding, menti.com. And of course, just type in that particular detail, submit what you feel and something that we can then maybe understand. What is it that you are thinking? Okay, so we have six people right now who are, um, you know, 70% are excited, 33% are optimistic. Um, a lot of them are obviously uncertain. All right, uh, I'll just wait for a few more people to, um, to sign in, uh, submit their emotion and make us understand what is it that you're feeling at the moment. All right, maybe I'll just wait another two minutes. Just go to menti.com, use the code 189746 and then we can have a reflection of what is it that you're thinking at the moment. I know it's been a long lockdown. I know it's been a scenario wherein we've had to uh, essentially be at home, very limited uh, going out, uh, especially kids, you know, having a, a small child at home, it's obviously very, very uh, difficult. But just to get an overall idea, I'll maybe just keep this on for another minute. So, so far, 7% are excited, 22% uh, are optimistic, 54, um, 52, 50% are uncertain, uh, and of course, 13% are worried, right? Now worried, it could be because of uh, the admission cycle, it could be because of careers, it could be many different things. And I'm sure uh, that's something that is kind of going through everybody's mind at the moment, um, you know, what is good is it's important that we need to be optimistic. What is good is that optimism is finally going to carry us through, um, you know, this whole crisis. We've never seen this particular crisis. We've never seen something like this. All the generations that are currently coexisting right now on the planet have not been part of the, um, what they call as the flu epidemic, the Spanish flu epidemic, wherein almost 5% of the Indian population, I believe, um, you know, got, uh, uh, you know, wiped out, which is quite sad. Of course, that's not the case now because obviously we're flattening the curve and ensuring that people are safe and healthy. So what I'll do is I'll just stop here just to get an idea. So 15% are obviously excited, 24% are optimistic, 48% and that's obviously very legible and you know very logical as well. Um, you know are uncertain. Some of you are actually are worried as well. You know the worry could be for various reasons. That's one of the reasons why we got this webinar today to understand what is it that's going through your mind. So I'll quickly jump back to what my brief presentation is all about. And I, I hope you can see this, uh, this particular presentation. Um, sure. I think this is an image that is reflective of how things have changed. This is from Honda's factory in Wuhan. And this factory is telling us a lot about how social distancing is something that will happen in the longer term, is something that is here to live. Uh, with for us is something that we have to kind of do at least till the time we don't get a vaccine. Uh, even if we get a vaccine, what you have to remember is that it will take a long time for a lot of people to get inoculated, to get vaccinated. Uh, and of course, the trials are going on at the moment. Let's hope for the best. Now, these are uh, scenes that are very, very uh, vivid, in my memory at least, about when the lockdown had started. A lot of people were wanting to go back to the home, especially the migrants. A lot of them, and I live very close to the highway, and a lot of the um, you know people were in the bags on their heads with you know with kids on their side walking all the way um, you know so automatically these are heart trending images of um, how this whole lockdown situation started of course what we also have to remember is that the big thing in our minds and you know from um, at least from our perspective from the management orientation perspective from an economics perspective having been at London School of Economics in the past is that what kind of um, you know economic recovery will we have? Or some people call it as a U-shaped recovery, wherein you know the GDP goes down, and of course it stays down for some time and then comes back again. Our best case scenario, I don't know whether that will be achieved. 
is um, the V-shaped uh, scenario, which is this whole idea that you you go down in terms of GDP growth, in terms of economic growth and everything else, but then you bounce back right again. Of course, for this, a lot of different mechanisms have to be in place. We are a global uh, globalized society now. Uh, supply chains have to be intact. Uh, cash flows have to be absolutely right. Remember right now, a lot of small and medium enterprises have limited cash flows. So automatically, because obviously they're not making any money, they're not in operation, they're not in production. So a lot of these things will um, count. If we suddenly open up the economy and the, the lockdown as well, um, there might be a situation later on wherein all of a sudden there are cases uh, of uh, COVID-19 again. So that then leads us to a W-shaped recovery wherein we go up, but we come back again. Some economists have predicted that it might be a, a, a swoosh. So you must have, you might, you're familiar with the Nike swoosh. And of course, uh, this is something that a lot of economists say is, is the kind of recovery that we might take. So you go down and then you have a gradual upward movement um, going forward, right? So this is how, uh, you know, the economy might recover. Of course, for that, what you also have to remember is India is well perched. India is one of the few economies wherein uh, it's growing positive. Of course, this data is before the 14th April lockdown was extended. Uh, with the extension of the lockdown, there might be further, um, you know, issues. So China and India are predominantly the only economies that might grow at about 1.9 and 1.5% respectively. But how, what does it mean to you? Why are you sitting here today? You want to understand about your careers. You want to understand about what shape is this going to take? You have to, you, you will have to understand about, you know, how do I choose what schools I actually choose? How do I choose what do I want to do? Where should I be going? There might be a lot of thoughts in your mind about, oh, should I be closer to home? There might be thoughts in your mind about, should I be uh, looking at the ROI in more detail? Of course, there's a lot of these thoughts. I'm just trying to give you a perspective that I believe will only get speeded up, right? So we've always been hearing about tech. We've always been hearing about technological disruption. We've always been hearing about robotics, automation, uh, big data, IoT, and, and so have you. Uh, we always keep hearing that the Industrial Revolution uh, 4.0 is very different from the other three Industrial Revolutions in the past. So the Industrial Revolution 1 obviously was a steam engine, and what happened thereafter, Industrial Revolution 2.0 was all about um, mechanization, assembly line production, you know, you have the Fords of the world, you have a lot of manufacturing factories, assembly lines. In Industrial Revolution 4.0, 3.0 was all about, um, you know, microchips, computerization. Industrial Revolution 4.0 is obviously a little different. In this case, what's happening is that in the past, we made machines help us do better work. But now what's happening is machines don't necessarily need us to do better work. That has implications going forward. It has implications on jobs that you will uh, be looking at in the future. It has implications on the kind of careers you're looking at. It has implications on the kind of specializations and functional courses that you might want to do. So just to give you a very, very, um, you know, brief idea, I don't have much time uh, uh, with you today, but to give you a very, very brief idea of what all this means. We already know, and this is something that came out in the paper yesterday and day before, is that by uh, 2025, 75% of the TCS employees will permanently work from home. What's happening here is obviously there's a huge change in dynamics. There'll be some industries that will do well, um, certain industries like the e-commerce industry, certain industries like you know medicine, healthcare. Um, these industries are expected to do well. Basic, essential, fast-moving consumer good products industries. There might be others whom which might not necessarily do well uh, for the short term. It, it might take you one year to recover. Let's say um, aviation. Uh, these, this is an industry which will take some time because people are not traveling. Right. Uh, future work trends will be increasing acceptance of remote working styles, uh, a lot of strategic work. We always thought that, you know, people who work from home are essentially IT employees or people who are, um, you know, part of KPOs and BPOs, not necessarily. Right. This is not necessarily the case. A lot of highly skilled work is now happening from home. CEOs are working from home. Board meetings are happening from home. That means a lot of psychological change that is taking place. The gig economy, the gig economy essentially is when you're going online and somebody offers you a short term contract, all that is going to increase as well. Why will it increase? It could be a function of 
supplementing your incomes. It could be a function of a lot of short-term, uh, let's say, loss of uh, revenue because of the short-term loss of jobs might gravitate you towards the gig economy, might gravitate you towards contract employment, short-term employment, a lot of intermediary employment as well. So, of course, the gig economy, especially online gig economy, will rise a great deal. A new style of leadership will be required, right? A new style of leadership which will uh, have to manage people not only from an IQ perspective but also manage people from an emotional perspective. People are all across the world and you're managing them from your um, you know, homes. How do you do that? A very different style of leadership, a servant style of leadership, a lot of healing style of leadership is required because a lot of people are going through a lot of stress at the moment. right? Um, of course, what is also happening is the rise of exponential technologies is taking place. You know, I used to keep watching uh, a Richie Rich cartoon, and then that cartoon had this rich uh, kid, Richie Rich, whose work was all done by machines. And of course, this is obviously becoming a reality in a certain way. It will affect uh, careers, right? How is it becoming a reality? Look at the kind of connected products and services we have now. Look at Internet of Things. We can connect everything together. Look at your Fitbits. We can connect all these Fitbits. Look at Netflix. Okay, the creation of highly optimized supply chains is happening already. Business innovations are coming, right? So, so the Ola's and the Ubers of the world, Zomato's of the world, these are all business innovations. They're actually changing the way you work. They're actually changing the way you will look at jobs in the future, right? Of course, at the same time, there's pressure on the resourceful, you know, the resource side. How do we sustain all this on the planet? New work arrangements is something that we've spoken about uh, a little while ago. What does it mean in terms of the future job roles? Okay, what does it mean? You know, what kind of jobs can you expect in a few years' time? Okay, uh, needless to say, a lot of the tech disruption will only get speeded up because of the coronavirus crisis. It only gets speeded up because of uh, the kind of pressures that corporates, companies, governments, publics are under. And the future will come much quicker than what we had thought earlier. Okay, so the kind of jobs you might expect is this is just to give you a bit of a, an understanding of the kind of jobs you might expect. So let's say in marketing, you might have a neuro AB tester, someone who, who understands brain scans, someone who understand, not only understands marketing, but also understands data, its analysis will be quite important, which means your domain knowledge and also your ability to analyze uh, a lot of data will be very important. You'll be someone who might be an algorithm bias auditor. Remember, you'll be working with machines. If you're working with machines, automatically machines work on algorithms. They work on software. How do you ensure that these algorithms don't have a bias? How do you ensure that these machines are able to read the data in the right kind of way? Similarly, if I look at automotive uh, sectors, you will have 3D printing engineers, you'll have autonomous vehicle engineers. A lot of all these will become quite important going forward. In medicine, you'll have augmented reality experts. Right, you have you'll have artificial intelligence experts uh, in in the medicine sector. So my idea today is not to necessarily give you a, a, a bible on all the courses, but these are the kind of uh, jobs that you will expect going forward. Now, just to leave with you a few thoughts, what kind of criteria you should be using? Obviously, you have to use criteria based around uh, a lot of things that are there in your mind. Does this particular university or college increase my employability? Does it increase uh, my ability? to get ready for the next 40 years of education that of uh, career that I'll have. People like us, maybe I'll be working for the next 15, 20 years, maybe a little longer if you don't want to get bored at home after retirement. But the fact is, your careers are being shaped for the next 40, 45 years, right? And the kind of formal education you have is something that will be quite important. Is the curriculum flexible? Is the curriculum contemporary? Remember, when you enter a college or a university, it's also important to understand whether I can actually practice the kind of stuff that I do uh, in terms of the concept. Is theory the only thing or is it something that I can learn by doing? Is it something that I can use by, by creating a few things uh, here and there? Uh, do we have close connections with the industry? Am I working with the industry from day one within that particular college or university? That's very, very important. At the same time, remember, when you come into the university, it's not just about about a certain base of courses that you should be learning. It is also about if I'm interested in world civilizations, if I'm interested in understanding artificial intelligence, does the college or the university help me do that? That's the kind of flexibility we're talking about here. At the same time, remember in the longer term, you might be a domain expert, you might be a finance expert, you might be a law expert, but if you're not, uh, 
conversant, if you're not comfortable with technology, with the usage of technology, with the usage of software, with the implications of the usage, it'll be quite important to you, to you for you to build that up. Remember, and because of what the scenario has been, which universities, colleges are quite adept in blended approaches. Online learning is not necessarily everybody's cup of uh, tea. And at the same time, it's something that requires a very different orientation. It's called a constructivist approach to learning that is very important, right? Which universities, college are, colleges are able to offer you much, much better experience on the online as well as the offline sphere. It's not because you're at home and that's the reason why, it's because learning can be treated in a 24 seven kind of cycle. OK, uh, strong industry academia partnerships, very, very important. These uh, industry partnerships should not just be about an internship, should not just be about a guest lecture, but should be about a lot of marriage of industry with the academic world so that a lot of co-creation happens, a lot of research happens together, a lot of curriculum building happens together. That is very, very important. These partnerships have to benefit you from day one. A lot of support for innovation and entrepreneurship is very, very important. A lot many times because of the way uh, colleges and universities are designed, they're essentially designed as ways and means to help you get a job. But the fact is the world of the future will require us to be self-reliant, will require us to move into a self-employment board, will require us to become entrepreneurial in our orientation. Does the university or the college offer you that space, offer you that facility, offers you the resources and the finance to help you kickstart that? At the same time, remember, and of course, this is something that is uh, useful to all, but at the same time, those who are contemplating whether I should be going abroad this year or not, and if you're deciding to actually stay back, of course, uh, it's good because there are progressive universities out there who are able to match the kind of learning that happens elsewhere. However, you should also be looking at the kind of international linkages that these universities and colleges in India are able to provide you, the kind of background, the kind of immersion, the kind of faculty who are coming from abroad and teaching you whether in online or in the offline face-to-face -face mode. At the same time, in the longer term, is there a way of exchange which is longer than an immersion, right? So these are some thoughts that I wanted to leave you behind with. Um, if you have, an, obviously, any queries, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this valuable piece of information, Dr. Vishal Talwar. And uh, I'm sure uh, this would really help students to uh, zero in on what kind of colleges or universities they should choose, uh, especially given in the current situation uh, where uh, you know, the, the decisions have to be really thought, thought after and prudent. Now, we have some sure. questions uh, from our audiences. First, we have uh, Gauri Mittal, who wants to ask, uh, I'm a student from Commerce Stream. Uh, which career is best to choose in today's scenario? Well, um, when you say commerce, I would assume that um, you may want to do a, a bachelor's in commerce. You may want to do even a, a bachelor's in business administration. Um, you know, you might want to align that with um, uh, wanting to do, a, let's say, a, a chartered accountancy, um, uh, you know, uh, later on or during the, the course. So I think it's important that you um, stick to that routine. Of course, uh, it's important that you stick to that. A lot of management courses um, will be as important as tech courses going forward. Okay, because you know uh, the future leaders, the future business leaders will be a, a, a combination kind of person who understands subjectivity, who understand the qualitative approach to um, you know the domain knowledge, who understand the implications of whether they are in the finance and in your case finance accounting will be your predominant driver but also remember that this cannot be done in isolation from the tech piece are you comfortable in the financial analysis are you comfortable in, comfortable in the analytics piece are you comfortable understanding codes and programs are you able to uh, analyze masses of data together is very important right so it will have to be uh, of course stick to your core domain because that core domain is going to give you benefit, but pick up a lot of other uh, micro courses, micro certifications, if your university or college doesn't offer you that, will be will in, the, in the tech space going forward, okay? Because the finance um, you know, field will get disrupted quite a bit uh, in the longer term, because you know, at the end of the day, a lot of finance people are maybe making balance sheets, are maybe making financial analysis statements, are, are uh, doing profit loss statements, the fact is, in the longer term, a lot of this can actually be done, and it's already happening, actually be done by machines. If you're an equity research, if you're an equity trader, 
a lot of the trading now is happening using uh, algorithms, is using uh, machines. What can you offer beyond your domain knowledge will be very, very important. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the answer, sir. And our next question is from Yash Ghildial. Uh, Yash wants to ask, uh, given the current crisis, should the government uh, focus on current economy or futures economy? Well, um, I think it has to be both. Uh, what you have to remember is that um, a lot of sacrifices obviously are being made right now uh, to ensure that the longer, um, uh, you know, uh, economic success of the country is intact, right? Right now, the government is looking at lives, right? And of course, remember, while we're looking at lives, what you also have to remember is that the India uh, is losing out about four to six billion dollars per day, right? Uh, in this particular scenario, right? That's the data. So some people say it's $4 billion, some people say $6 billion, some people say $7 billion, but remember the range is about four to seven or $8 billion per day. And of course, uh, that's something that is getting affected. It's affecting supply chains, it's affecting cash flows, it's affecting uh, businesses that uh, are not able to make any money. They've had, they've been job losses, migrants have moved back. So getting them back again uh, from the other states will be quite, uh, not that easy it can't happen on day one of uh, you know on the 4th of may it cannot happen that way right so automatically the current sacrifices are predominantly health oriented right but obviously the government will also be under pressure to kick start the economy so they're taking some steps 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent capacity utilization in some industries that has to get speeded up okay there are many sectors the many districts um, you know in the country which don't necessarily have um, you know coronavirus cases Okay, um, what do you do with those kind of places? So those will have to kickstart, those will have to come up to full steam as quickly as possible. Okay, so I think if they take those measures right now, if they obviously increase the number of testings, uh, if, if they're able to um, isolate uh, certain locations and let the other uh, locations become uh, you know, normal, right? And then kickstart those economies, it will be very, very important. Because I think it's, you know, the government will always want to balance uh, the shorter term uh, issues, losses, benefits, along with the long term. It's always the long term that is important, but the short term problems that people are facing will have to be sorted out also. Great. Thank you so much for your answer, sir. And uh, though we have a lot of questions uh, from the audiences uh, right now, but then due to scarcity of time, uh, we'll have to move on to the uh, other panelists that we have. Uh, sure. So now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Shivendra Mathur uh, and uh, you know, have the honor to, to get his piece of information and education uh, on how to choose a college and university at this time of crisis. So Dr. Shivendra, uh, welcome, sir. And uh, I, would, I would like you to uh, take on the presentation, sir. I'm uh, passing on the screen rights to you. Thank you. Dr. Shivendra, can you hear me, sir? Uh, Dr. Shivendra, uh, your microphone is on mute, sir. Yeah, you, yeah, my, uh, yeah. Yes, sir. So good yes, morning, everyone. Hear. Okay. Am, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. You can go ahead, sir. Everybody's Very able good. to listen to you. Thank you. So morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'll introduce myself and thank you, Shitesh and Dr. Talwar for such a wonderful uh, introduction and start. Uh, I will tell you a little about NIT University's story and then uh, we will move on to the strategies uh, for the students to how to choose a college or a university. So I'll tell you a little brief about uh, what we were and how we were during this all this lockdown stage. And honestly, I'm telling you, hand over my heart, March every year is normally one of the busiest months in the academic calendar. And all my colleagues from other universities would agree to this. Our lecture theaters are always bulging, long coffee queues, and library, which is rarely visited, has all the shelves empty during March. There are all interactions in multilingual uh, at all all places. Non-stop interactions happen. But this year, due to COVID, there is a silence. The buildings are in lockdown, staff barred from the offices. 
but one thing which continued is learning it got displaced but was not discontinued and the reasons for these are that there are online platforms available there are hundreds of methods available which we can utilize to continue with the learning processes so in nutshell what we can say covid or whatever we had disrupted classes but we have undisrupted learning which continued now coming to the core topic of how to choose a or what will be the ideal college selection strategy post lockdown stage which is a very very crucial uh, piece of information and a question and the data which uh, was shown just a moment back by dr talwar which shows 50% of you are a little anxious about or worried about it uh, i'll i'll summarize these strategies into five dimensions namely infrastructure industry relevant programs and curriculum learning tools and learning resources teaching and learning methods and services for the students so these are the five groups or the five dimensions on which if you if you if you try to uh, evaluate how which and it will help you to bring out to a to a situation where you can choose a university or a uh, what what uh, strategy you need to adopt when you choose a college or a university post lockdown stage so coming one by one let's start with infrastructure during this lockdown and covid we were all thinking that infrastructure basically pertains only to the it infrastructure how much of bandwidth which all tools whether it is google teams etc uh, uh, google meet or something that is not the case it infra is crucial it is important but not the only one when we say when prime minister modi talks about the new normal what does it mean what does it entails it entails that there has to be a social distance no matter whether you are on campus or you are far away or a remote location so consider two scenarios you are on campus there is a new normal situation where you are supposed to be in a little distance maintain a little distance from each other how do you do that so the uh, this infrastructure of a campus of a university should support that much to you which means you should have access to your all your resources your library or everything from your hostel room itself which also means that your centralized air conditioning should not be there because as you are aware fully that the central air conditioning in these covid stages are actually very very catastrophic so we are a university which is in the foothills of aravalli which is around 90 km from gurgaon and we have a 100 acre green campus details of which you can check on the website when it comes to the it infrastructure part well since inception we started the university in 2009 and since inception we have been dealing with online teaching part for a simple reason that all our programs starting btech management mtech programs we say that uh, students can if they go for internship or industry practice we call for 6 months and during these 6 months all the courses are delivered from campus to all the locations within the country through a remote learning platform the second aspect which we or the second dimension of it is what we call industry relevant programs and curriculum which my colleague dr talwar has just touched upon also as you are aware that there are burgeoning demands in sectors such as analytics data science cyber security biotechnology ai ml all these buzzwords all around biotechnology in specific areas is one of the such key parameters so what we do we say that industry relevant programs here means that the you are relevant to the industry from day one which means when you join the university as an intern or as an employee you are productive from first day first hour how do we do that we ensure that you are 6 months on an internship we ensure that when your curriculum is designed it is designed in consultation with the industry partners so we have around 600 700 industry partners with us who tell us that these components of artificial intelligence are to be touched upon for example tensor flows need to be covered for example that in data visualization we want uh, 
Tableau, we want Power BI, etc. These these are the courses which are these are the tools which are to be uh, covered. So industry relevant programs and curriculum becomes one of the very very important parameter. Third dimension of it is what we call learning tools and learning resources. What are learning tools? University should be equipped to handle the new normal of social distancing, which involves very robust IT infrastructure, capability to handle remote classes. When we send students for six months of industry practice for internship, we conduct the classes using technology. Library is accessible all across. Learning tools and resources also means that all these MOOCs, blended learning, all these methods are integrated within the curriculum itself. The fourth such dimension is what we call teaching and learning methods, which has multiple layers to it, and I'll touch for each one of them briefly. First, what we call flexible learning. Now, what do we mean by flexible learning? We say customize your courses as per your requirement. It is not a watertight or straight jacketed that you are doing engineering, so you have to do only computer science courses. No, that is not the case at all anymore. We decide, you decide what all courses you want to do. 31% of your curriculum you choose, which means that there are certain core courses that you do along with certain other courses. For example, you want to do a course from uh, management, you want to do a course from uh, finance, you want to do a course from liberal arts, you decide as to what you want to do and based on your on your goal, your aim in life. That is what we call flexible learning. Blended learning, flipped classroom, use of intensive use of MOOCs, online courses. So you take the credit, one credit, two credits, blend it with your current curriculum and you're good to go. The reason for doing all such things is that you are completely adapted to the new world order, which is that you are not, it is gone other days when a faculty used to come in a class, deliver a lecture, you will hear, because whatever the faculty is teaching you is already in the books, right? You are born in a 21st, 20th century. You have information pathway accessible to you. Whatever is written in the books is accessible, accessible on internet also. So it is. it has to be blended. It has to be from all sources coming together. That way the learning happens maximum. So the notion of an educate, educator as the knowledge holder who imparts uh, wisdom to their pupils is no longer fit for the purpose of this 21st century education. The students uh, should be able to gain access to knowledge and even learn a technical skill through a few clicks on their phones, tablets, computers, etc. So we are here redefining the role of an educator in the classroom and lecture theater. Which means that the role of an educator or a teacher will need to move towards facilitating you, your development as contributing to members of society. Third dimension of it is continuous learning or holistic development. A very unique experiment and very interesting experiment that we did. All of us have some passion, some hobby, something apart from our education, right? So we experimented upon that you are a footballer, you want to play football, along with to pursue a course in engineering or management, you can choose this hobby as an activity-oriented course and embed in your curriculum and earn credit for it. After all, when a company comes for placement, they don't just look at your grades, right? They look you as a person, how, how intense personality you are. So if you are good at a certain thing, you earn credit for it and you develop. The fourth such dimension, which my colleague also mentioned, is about entrepreneurial skills. Now, entrepreneurship is becoming very, very critical and important with China being whatever it is now happening. Role of Indian entrepreneurs is becoming pivotal. So we have to nurture this entrepreneurial skill in across all the programs in the university. The next dimension is about creativity and critical thinking. How do we develop that? So creativity and critical thinking, you have to analyze things, you have to see things in a much more deeper level. Just to illustrate by example, if I say I'm a tennis player and I've been playing tennis for past 15 years. But if I ask you a question, why is tennis ball fuzzy? So then that, that initiates a thought process in you that why tennis ball is fuzzy and why can't it be smooth? 
so critical thinking creativity these are very very important things which are shaping the world one another example of it is china spent some um, billions of dollars in creating hospitals and a lot of uh, accolades were given to china within four days they developed a 5000 bed hospital what did indian government do they converted all railway coaches into hospitals you see this is what we call creativity and out of box thinking and the last thing they mention about is what we call services for students so for holistic development stu students this pandemic has also brought about one change which what what we call we are globally interconnected and there's no such no longer such a thing as what we call isolated issues and actions one person is things in wuhan and the world is suffering now so successful people coming in the decades need to be able to understand this interrelatedness and navigate across boundaries to leverage their differences and work in a globally collaborative way so students should have exposure to all facets social sector sports public policy liberal arts besides the industry relevant curriculum to make them future ready that is all from my side a brief now if open to questions should you have any thank you uh thank you so much uh, dr mathur for sharing this valuable piece of information and uh, we certainly have questions from uh, our audiences uh, the first one is from akshat bahuguna akshat wants to ask what should be the ideal blend for entrepreneurial education and practical aspects of the same that the colleges should provide so uh, entrepreneurial uh, journeys entrepreneurial things are very romantic uh, prime of its side uh, see universities colleges in india they are providing incubation cells to help nurture this talent uh, we uh, offer one course as a compulsory course across streams and then should the student be interested we uh, the universities including us we provide an entrepreneurial space where you we incubate we provide some expert uh, expertise in terms of all spaces you want to develop an application you want to develop a product or a process or something patenting everything those those ecosystem to nurture that um, uh, entrepreneurial spirit is very very crucial and important so uh, for universities and for you if you want to choose uh, uh, this as a journey entrepreneurial journey my recommendation suggestion to you is first make a solid back backup plan once you are once you are on a very solid plan then you build upon it a superstructure of entrepreneur because should there be a any any failure there is always a fallback option available to you university is one such heaven where you can make mistakes learn from it and again grow so so uh, uh, if the question if the what infrastructure and things there are ample of opportunities we have we have uh, vc uh, you you can we can introduce to guys uh, venture capitalists there is a ecosystem to support you and based on these we have five or seven success stories one two of them are international now uh, startups from the university great sir okay. and uh, yes sir and the other question no. is from uh, Mithal, uh, mitali kathuria uh, Mitali wants to ask, uh, I'm confused between BBA and BCom. Which one do you think would be more beneficial uh, you know, from a career point of uh, view? Uh, well, see, uh, Mitali, uh, BBA versus BCom, it's a difficult situation because BBA is more for if you want what we want to do after doing your graduation is my next question. And I, since I have no, we're not talking to each other directly, so I'm just answering on your behalf. Uh, after BBA, the next progression is that you go for MBA, right? After MBA, you want to either start a, a, a company of your own, you want to go an entrepreneurial journey, or you want to join a corporate to work for a few years, and then you can decide whatever you want to do. So BBA is more of application oriented, rather it's like um, uh, it's more business oriented. You need to, you will be undergoing courses in more of business perspective. BCom is more theoretical more in terms of accounting processes so it's like a um, very vexed question whether you want to go on a theoretical framework or you want to go on a practical journey so if you want to take on things in a more practical way you want to you want to take on things in a business side you want to go in a corporate ladder then suggestion recommendation is to go for bba because then you can take up the journeys very very fast 
Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shivendra. And uh, I'm sure this will provide uh, clarity to the students regarding the selection of courses and obviously the uh, selection of uh, universities or colleges once uh, the lockdown is uh, you know, over. And uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Rekha Vidj, who is the Deputy Dean of Academics at the North Cap University. Dr. Rekha, uh, no, I would, I would uh, welcome you to speak uh, to the audiences and guide them uh, through this crisis, ma'am. Thank you and welcome. Uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, Dr. Rekha, you're audible now, ma'am. I'm passing okay, on the you... screen. Yes, I'm passing on the screen sharing rights to you. Okay, ma'am. Okay, I hope my screen is visible. Ma'am, your screen is visible. In case you want, you can also choose to share your webcam in case you want to. Uh, we can see your screen. Uh, sure, I will. Okay, is my webcam uh, visible? Uh, not yet, ma'am. Okay, is it visible yes, now? We, yes, ma'am, we can see your webcam uh, and perhaps you would get a pop-up to share your screen as well. Uh, do, do you see I the guess. sharing option? You can, you can, uh, no? go to the sh uh, sharing option and uh, show your screen okay i think it's visible my okay can you please tell me if it's visible now yes ma'am we can see uh, the webcam and and the screen uh, as well thank you okay 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 thank you uh, good morning everyone and uh, Thank you, Shitish, for the invitation on this esteemed platform and giving me an opportunity to put across my thoughts. Uh, Dr. Tarbar uh -huh. and Dr. Kapoor have done a wonderful job, and in fact, uh, the job is half done now. So, uh, I'm uh, Rekha. I'm the Deputy Dean Academics and Associate Professor in the Computer Science Department of the North Cap University, which is in the heart of the city of Gurgaon. Uh, so I think a lot have been discussed about the crisis which has occurred due to coronavirus. I'll just uh, brief on that and we all know that it is not less than that by the world wars in the past. Basically, it's a biological war that, has, uh, that we all are going through. Uh, this crisis has created, uh, uh, you know, issues in the health sector, economic, economically as well as socially. There are uncertainties in all areas of life, and definitely, as we, as uh, you know, uh, the survey shown by Dr. Talwar uh, shows that half of the students who are registered are uncertain as to what is going to happen later on. So uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the education sector. Uh, this is the most challenging situations for two uh, kinds of students: those who are seeking admissions, and of course, those who are seeking jobs as they also don't know what's going to happen. So many students who have uh, got placement offers in the final year, their job offers have been revoked given the current scenario. So for them also, it's a very crucial situation. Uh, nonetheless, our duty is to follow all guidelines and uh, prepare ourselves for the unwarranted situations. So let, let, let's see how we actually look at the current scenario. So, uh, so for the students, uh, yes, CBIC, UGC, AICT, NCRT, all have been directed by Ministry of HRD to come with alternate academic calendars. So, yes, the uh, the calendars which the universities and the schools have been following uh, it is all gone haywire, and we are not sure whether the next semester is going to begin on time. So, there's an uncertainty as to when the students are taking uh, seeking admissions will join not only in India, but abroad as well. When is the next session going to begin? Uh, yes, there is the considerable financial impact on families uh, because of uh, you know, loss in businesses, uh, businesses closing down, uh, a lot of financial impact is there. So uh, definitely many uh, universities and schools are working on how to reduce the burdens on the families. 
and even this can be a deciding factor on uh, where and how to go about in which university to take admissions uh, so yes the financial impact is considerable uh, online is a new mantra mostly all the schools and the universities have gone online during this scenario uh, the teaching has not stopped learning has not stopped whether it is uh, the uh, regular teaching learning pedagogy which the university follows or whether it is beyond the curriculum online courses which are being provided by various universities so uh, how should we prepare how are the students supposed to prepare the first and foremost thing is stay calm and patient uh, things will definitely get better. Everyone is working towards getting things uh, better. And our government is definitely doing a wonderful job. Uh, you can keep yourself engaged in various activities, whatever hobbies you have currently, or you can even develop your new hobbies. Uh, yes, many online courses are being offered free, free of course. So you can look at uh, Coursera.org. Uh, Harvard is also offering many uh, free courses. So try to enroll in different courses and continue your learning. Uh, you can enroll in different types of courses to find out your interest. Let's say if you're con confused whether you should go for law studies or you should take up management or psychology, just try and en enroll in various courses and find where you're feeling more in interested. Uh, of course, you need to keep yourself updated on the latest circular, which Shiksha.com definitely does a wonderful job in informing students as to how, as to which exam has been postponed or when it when is it scheduled. So keep a track of all of those in your yourself in social and supportive work like online volunteering. Of course, you cannot go out and volunteer, but you can do something online, blogging, etc., and develop your communication skills. Now, in general, what are the factors? we consider when we have to choose a university so the first and foremost thing that we look at is the academic reputation and the rankings of that university uh, yes now we have the nirf ranking given by the government of india you can have a look at that where a particular university stands uh, how are the jobs and placement in that particular university uh, yes that is the most important outcome after your education so look at the uh, situation in that, uh, the location and infrastructure, uh, whether the university is uh, you know, located in remote location, not accessible to the uh, industry around it, uh, plays a very important role. And of course, it's infrastructure. Faculty is the core resource of a university. So you have to see what kind of faculty and the teaching resources the university has. Uh, the courses and curriculum are you know, it should not be a regular old course and curriculum. Nowadays, universities keep abreast with the latest ones and uh, they, they regularly update their course and curriculum as well as it is aligned with the industry. So have a look at that, uh, whether the university is uh, making the student, uh, you know, get into all these co-curricular, extracurricular activities. What is the social and the cultural life in that university, whether a holistic development of the student is taking place in that university or not? And of course, how is the university connected to the industry? Or is it having international linkages and international connections? Uh, or it is all about how you are going to land into an industry and how well the industry is globally uh, acknowledging itself. Uh, now coming to the uh, this, uh, you know, many universities basically uh, focus on the the lower part of the Bloom taxonomy. This is a Bloom taxonomy for education that you can see here. Uh, in this, uh, the lower part are the basic parts. If 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 someone is just working uh, in making students remember stuff, or you know, as we say, rot rot based of education or simply understanding the different concepts or maximize how to apply those contexts, you know, make diagrams or uh, solve or calculate. Those are the, these are the basic bottom of the pyramid. This is uh, mostly all the universities get into this and uh, this is the bottom. Now you have to look at the university which is working towards the top of the uh, pyramid. You have to see whether the university is helping you develop analytical skills, helping you create something new, build something new, uh, evaluate, judge, or critique, or criticize what, whatever is there, analyze it, 
uh, examine and categorize this is where your complete development will take place so choose those universities which have curriculum and courses which help you develop these skills so let's say these are the skills problem solving project based education and so on uh, now, one more important thing that you have to keep in mind is that nowadays a single stream is not enough. A multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary courses and education is the in thing. Basically, we know that humanities, art, science, engineering all branch from the same tree. So, do not uh, limit yourself into one area. Try to uh, get uh, skills from different areas, uh, like as uh, Dr. Talwar was also mentioning, that if you are uh, trying to get into, let's say, psychology or commerce, uh, uh, there's, there's definitely going to be a use of, uh, you know, some coding somewhere uh, in those areas. So try to develop your coding skills. In fact, nowadays, government is making coding mandatory for all the streams. So uh, so how, how these different streams can be merged so try to take courses from different areas and develop your critical thinking, writing and research skills. Uh, so what are the other current and related factors? When I say current and related factors, it means that uh, based on the situation which COVID-19 has created, there are certain factors which have become very important, which uh, you should consider before you do your college selection. So, so look at look at the flexibility of the university. Whether uh, the university could move uh, online uh, quickly and uh, their curriculum, their schedule did not get changed. They could adapt to the technology. They could keep the students engaged throughout the uh, entire crisis time. They could follow their schedules properly. Uh, they could conduct their exams online. And these uh, this shows that the uh, this university is ready for any crisis situation. Of course, private un government universities are uh, definitely on at the top ranking universities, but then there are many private universities which are more flexible, which take quick decisions and uh, bring the best of the situation. Uh, yes, you should look at the courses which are more relevant now considering the situation. Uh, so in technology, you will find uh, courses which are very useful in the areas of cloud computing, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, business analytics, uh, Internet of Things, uh, healthcare, robotics, clinical psychology uh, and dynamic leadership. So these are some of the areas which have become more relevant with respect to the situation and uh, definitely many of them are interdependent for example robotics uh, is dependent on ai and ml and iot is also dependent on ai and ml so so you can pick and choose which areas you would want to uh, study in uh, there are many universities which have started considering the ib grades and sat scores considering the situation that students who wanted to uh, go abroad are have started rethinking on the scenario and uh, they would be either stuck uh, as to what we should do now so try to reach those kind of universities which are open-minded and their curriculum also suits the international exposure so uh, look at those universities as well uh, so uh, yes, there are many universities because the situation is, is the kind of a panic situation. So this, there are uh, universities which are giving admissions pro provisionally. So if you are able to get admission provisionally, even before your 12th results are out and uh, JE scores are pending, uh, you know, some kind of panic can be reduced and you'll feel that you have something in hand. Uh, yeah, of course, there is a lot of help uh, available. So HRD Ministry has launched a helpline portal for the students. You can approach them for any government uh, related issues and uh, guidelines which they are uh, uh, generating. You can visit websites and call different universities uh, for their admissions. Uh, do take inputs from your seniors at school and your family members and of course, even your relatives. Uh, there are many online groups that have been set up by many universities uh, for the students to discuss their concerns. So many students can come together and share their concerns and discuss. So these kind of groups have been generated. So you all can search for those and uh, contact the universities. Thank you so much. And uh, questions and answers are welcome now. Thank you so much, Dr. Rekha. Uh, I'm sure this would help uh, the students a lot. 
and making their decision and give them a clarity on how to proceed with the you know the current situation and the admission cycle uh, so we have a question uh, uh, regarding btech specializations uh, which btech specializations will boom post covid situation and which specializations will take longer than usual to recover uh, see, as uh, I had mentioned in the, on the slide also that, uh, yes, uh, uh, definitely BTEC computer science is one of the most sought after and uh, uh, also giving maximum outcome in this current scenario. Uh, but yes, uh, the other uh, specializations like uh, uh, electronics, which has a good blend of, uh, you know, Internet of Things and e e even VLSI, uh, you know, these kind of uh, specializations will produce good output uh, in the long term thank you great thanks so much and uh, we have vartika with us vartika puri uh, she wants to ask which model of the bloom taxonomy uh, north cap university is following yes the north cap university is definitely uh, catering to the topmost layer of uh, the bloom taxonomy uh, we have an incredible number of courses wherein we try to develop the creative thinking and the problem solving techniques of the students at the North Cap University, we also have something like tinkering lab where students are allowed to tinker around. So there are students who uh, are from engineering background, from management background, from law background who come together and try to produce, produce something new. Uh, we have an incubation center where students are allowed to, uh, those who have you know uh, good ideas, they're allowed to experiment on those ideas. So a lot of work is being done at the topmost layer of the Bloom Taxonomy at the North Cap University. Great, thank, thank you so much, ma'am. And the final question is from uh, Rahul Gulati. Rahul wants to mm -hmm. ask if a student goes for a specialized course like BTech Computer Science with specialization in data science, want to restrict him in getting a job and uh, how would the job situation change for engineers post COVID-19? Uh, see, data science is definitely the uh, most in demand. Uh, whether it was pre-COVID or post-COVID, data science has been in demand for quite a long time, and it's just going to be still in demand after COVID-19. Uh, once a student is studying a uh, data science specialization, it is not just limited to uh, the courses related to data science. There are a lot of courses uh, under the umbrella of data science which are taught, uh, which are uh, related to machine learning, like uh, you know, uh, image processing, uh, natural la language processing, where from where data is generated. So, so the stream is not just limited to data science. The student can branch out into other areas as well. Uh, of course, then all the core courses are there which the students study. So there are languages which the student takes up. There is, you know, C language, there's Java language, there's Python language, and uh, uh, other core courses which like databases and all that. So. All these are also taught, so the student can choose uh, as per his or her interest. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rekha. Uh, and uh, it was indeed an honor to have you here. And uh, I'm, I'm sure this piece of information would really help the students. Uh, we would uh, move on to our next uh, panelist. We have with us Mr. Sandeep Munjal, who is the director at Vedatya, Vedatya Institute. Uh, welcome, Mr. Sandeep. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your presence here. Yes, sir. Can you hear us, uh, Mr. Sandeep? Uh, Shadid, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, yes. It's clear now. Okay. Uh, would you want me to turn the webcam on? Yes, sir, you can switch on the webcam, and uh, I'm, I'm passing on the screen sharing rights to you. Just give me a moment. Thank you. I will not be using the presentation. Can you see me? Uh, Mr. Sandeep, uh, we, we cannot see your screen as of now. Your voice is breaking. Okay. Uh, audible now? 
Uh, yes, sir. It's a little better. Okay. I guess I'll get started. Thank you. I think this. I think it's important for us to uh, be able to speak uh, to potential students and speak about aspects from at least the industry perspective. Uh, our colleagues have already spoken on uh, some of the aspects, and I think uh, what I would really do here is uh, to spend some time that I have uh, in coming at the question from a different context. And I think I come from a student's uh, perspective. Uh, as a student, I think uh, when some of you are worried and uh, some of you expressed your optimistic view of the situation, uh, I think there's well, there are reasons to be worried about what the pandemic is going to uh, lead us. Uh, there is uh, enough evidence on the ground to suggest that we are going to be okay. And I think what this really will require is an orientation where we look at solutions uh, and not make the situation more than it is. Of course, it's a serious situation from the inside. Uh, and the governments have reacted and uh, industries have reacted and educational institutions have done their bit. Uh, so we at Vedapia were fairly quick in moving uh, to an online platform of delivery. Uh, and, and I think uh, you will see that sooner or later, that competency will be built by educational institutions. So we have some who are already set up, uh, you know, a technology back, backbone and you know, they were oriented uh, to deliver uh, programs and sessions using the technology and others are uh, expressing some confidence in they're going to follow through fairly quickly. So I don't think over a, uh, over a mid to long term, that's going to be the challenge. I think the challenge really is going to be how the learner adapts themselves. Uh, I've been watching my sons then related to an online I think observing how they respond. I think uh, that responsibility for schools that I am speaking College, and I have stated this many times. Blended learning, very well in that program. Any reason they work very well, responsibility for learning that is good. And where you are in it, you are in what phase of life for that is a little different uh, at that point. So mm -hmm. that's something that all undergrad learners uh, now Prashant, you can't hear me? Uh, Mr. Sandeep, you're not audible, sir. Uh, am I, is the voice breaking or not audible at all? Uh, no, sir, your, your voice is breaking. So I guess that's the... I guess I said, uh, is it completely broken to uh, till what point uh, were you able to hear me? No, sir, the aud audio quality is uh, really low. So, uh, no, it's not comprehensible. It's not because I can hear you very clearly. Right, right, right. So the audience can hear me, but then uh, uh, your audio output is uh, breaking in. Uh, so let's do one thing, Mr. Sandeep. Uh, perhaps uh, no, try, try a different hardware. Perhaps you can uh... just give me a second. Let me try it again. Yes, we can see your screen now, sir. Yeah, not using a presentation. Perhaps you can try to log in uh, with a laptop, uh, if possible. Let, let me try using a laptop. Okay, sir. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we were experiencing a technical glitch uh, on uh, Mr. Madral's part. Just, just give uh, give us a few moments. Uh, he's trying to log in to the laptop quickly, and uh, we'll be right back. Please be here with us. Thank you. And uh, apologies for the inconvenience. Super. Um.
Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Perfect. Well, I hope this and apologies to everyone. And I guess technology goes thus far and no further sometimes. Uh, so uh, just to check again, I'm audible to everyone. Yes, sir. You're audible. OK. And we can, we can okay. see Thank you. Thank well, you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll get uh, started. Uh, and uh, again, apologies for the time that uh, I had to get back. Uh, I, the point I was making was uh, that it's, it's fine for students to uh, to think about the current situation and be worried. Uh, but I think uh, you would need to recognize that at the end of the day, when you were looking at sources of information, you were largely still looking at online sources. All that information is available to you. You will realize that uh, institutions, I mentioned, and I'm not sure if students heard me when I spoke the first time, uh, that there are institutions that migrated to an online platform fairly quickly. Uh, and they saw the situation coming and they responded to that. Uh, there are others who are going to do that fairly quickly themselves. Uh, if there is a technology backbone uh, that needs to be put in place, that will happen. So you, the point I'm making is that the education industry will do what it needs to do. Uh, the private institutions as well as the government institutions. One may be a little ahead of the other, but that's going to happen. Uh, the point that's important here is how do learners respond? Uh, the response of learners uh, typically in the blended mode uh, and especially where uh, the delivery largely at least these days it is uh, pretty much um, you know in an online mode with no contact uh, that's where the responsibility of learners is going to be higher so do start thinking about the fact that if the world is going to need social distancing for a while if you're going to be learning through a blended mode there's going to be a high level of responsibility with which you will need to uh, you know approach your education uh, i i guess everyone wants to understand how am i going to look at potential options remember you were doing this research online anyways so all the information about uh, you know potential colleges or universities or programs that you're interested in you can get access to that information i think it's going to be a little difficult question to answer for parents not for this generation. I think you are fairly uh, connected with technology and you've been using that. You've been present on social platforms uh, uh, and you've been receiving information. So you guys are going to be all right in getting that information ready. It really depends. Uh, I kind of uh, put, uh, you know, undergrad applicants or aspirants for, uh, you know, getting into programs into two groups. Folks who are very clear what they want to do. So for them, it's a question of figuring out where do I go to and they have their wish list of places they want to get accepted uh, and they've done their research. They have found out about them. You know, uh, my colleagues earlier mentioned various attributes that you're looking for. Uh, and I think I, I, students will realize 
uh, that you know potentially everyone is soon you know going to be saying the same kind of stuff so everyone will say that you know faculty is fantastic and uh, learning resources are great and all of that uh, so i'll come in a minute how do you figure out the fact that you cannot physically be visiting places uh, i think there is a ability that you will need to build to validate uh, so if you've got a list of five places five universities or institutes uh, how do you figure out which one to apply to a little worrisome situation for folks who have an open mind in a way they haven't really come down to what do i want to do uh, and that's where i think a little more effort and quick effort needs to go in terms of pulling out information uh, lastly i think folks who have decided what they want to do would have decided on the basis of what they wanted to do in terms of their general like you know liking something uh, not everyone wants to become a chef not everyone wants to become a hotelier not everyone wants to look at engineering a, a, as a pathway there is that spin that's going to come which is going to talk about how the covid situation is going to affect potential careers you know will there be jobs in those areas what kind of employment opportunities uh, my general sense is yes uh, look at that information think about it but i think the fundamental a question still that remains to be answered is what is it that you want to do with the next 30 35 40 years of uh, of your life so you're not just you know embedded yourself into a job situation uh, you are looking at a career pathway so do take information with a pinch of salt uh, what is relevant today once a vaccine is out might not be relevant uh, you know a, a year down the line uh, so you still may want to keep uh, a sense of uh, normalcy uh, to your decision making and not really overreact uh, also look at places where they have moved to an online entrance exam so for example vedatya moved to an online 100% online entrance process uh, not just the interviews also the exam process uh, over the years i have seen a lot of parents would actually visit the institute uh, even though they have you know kind of figured out that we are let's say in the top two three four five options uh, for the programs that we have to offer they would visit the place they would want to look at the hostels uh, they would want to meet the, prof uh, the, the teachers and the professors uh, they would want to uh, maybe speak to a few students uh, and generally get the vibe of a place uh, and get a sense that you know is this the place for my uh, my, my ward to study in uh, and i think that is where I, uh, some amount of adjustment uh, will be required because possibly we don't know when that uh, is going to be able to happen uh, so you need to be able to uh, adjust to the fact that there is information that's available on the digital platforms use that uh, you help your parents also to uh, to look at that information in fact we uh, offer what we call the institutional evaluation matrix so which talks about all the attributes that uh, that an institution should offer for a quality education with examples of what we are doing. And then we leave two blocks on that grid for a student to use that to you know, measure up other options that they're looking at. What this will do is, and you can structure it yourself, you know, just put all the information on the table. What will be critical is to validate that information. Some amount of validation can happen by you know, following uh, what people are doing. So you know, if somebody says, you know, we are big on applied learning. So question to ask is, can you validate for me? Can you give me a few examples that will tell me that the institute or the university for the program that you're talking about, that uh, it, it really is following up uh, on, on those promises. What this will uh, bring you to is a sense of confidence in decision making. So one is a question of you being made an offer. Second is a question of you making a choice uh, from the offers that you have received which one is the place you go to and i think if you do it in a little uh, you know analytical manner by you know, in a structured way you should be able to arrive at that ask for uh, you know references to current students ask for references to alumni speak to them uh, i think there is nothing better than being able to speak to somebody who has gone through what you intend to do uh, to be able to get uh, and, and ask for multiple uh, lot of times parents and students had an opportunity during that you know physical visit to meet people uh, you can still ask institutions and, and we are doing that so we are setting up uh, small sessions for a parent uh, with a head of school the idea is uh, for that you know the level of confidence can only come up when you've spoken to uh, people that can happen in an online 
mode because that's how it has to happen today. So these opportunities, uh, I'm sure more institutions are going to, as we go down the road, enable for you, latch on to them. But typically, you know, the decision, uh, if I were to, you know, walk back a couple of uh, steps in terms of the conversation that I've had with you, uh, do not decide to do something just because uh, it looks like it's going to be in vogue. Uh, there is a lot of push uh, where people start, you know, looking at a, a given direction just become, because it became popular or it became uh, apparent that it might be commercially, uh, you know, great because that's not how careers work. Uh, if you put me into a direction where I'm not set up in terms of my skills basket, in terms of my interest, in terms of my attitudinal, uh, uh, you know, where I am with my attitude, it is going to be a misfit situation. So don't rush into direction. So suddenly artificial engineering is, uh, artificial intelligence is uh, in vogue. Everyone wants to do that. It has to be an informed decision. Uh, and remember the options are going to be available in plenty. Use the time that you have uh, you have lots of time at home. I think this is where, and one of my colleagues mentioned that, there are free courses available. Use your time to see how do you work in a situation where inputs are being offered to you uh, in a manner where uh, the inputs are largely in an online format. How do you receive them? How are you responding to assessments? Uh, is there a level of discipline with which uh, you are uh, able to take your learning forward? Uh, because I think that's going to be critical. Uh, the education industry side of things is going to come uh, and, and, and you know, do what it needs to do. Uh, that's not what's going to be the challenge, I think, two, three months down the line. Uh, there may be few institutions who would have a little competitive advantage uh, having come from a, a technology orientation, but soon everyone's going to pack that. Uh, what's going to be interesting is how you as a student respond, because at the end of the day, it's your choice your life, your decisions, uh, and you just need to be uh, able to make those uh, to ensure that you're moving forward. Now, our institution offers programs oriented towards the service industry. Service industry is going to go through a very interesting phase. Uh, and and uh, I know they're going to adapt, evolve, uh, and find solutions. That's the orientation a student will need to go uh, towards. Uh, from governments to everyone else, really nobody knows uh, how long and which way things are going to go. But my general sense of optimism is that the world has seen situations like that before, not in our lifetime, but 1930s saw that. So I think there's there's a cycle to it. What we do need to do as, uh, as a species is to respond to that. And I'm sure all of you uh, would be those solution finders uh, and be open to a changing situation. A lot of times change brings opportunities. I'm a firm believer uh, that you know in every crisis there is an opportunity uh, and that opportunity is is for you to to for you to leverage uh, but do not get restricted by the fact that your cbsc result has not come some of you might have a paper missing which will happen soon uh, get on with the program of finding your choices uh, institutions that are you know doing their entrance processes get on with those processes so that you have a few options on hand so it's more about you know doing what you can do uh, versus being you know limited by a thought process which says that you know i still have a paper to give i don't know it. Well, those are variables that are not in your control i'm sure the government will fix uh, those aspects but have your orientation uh, with uh, a mindset which is focused towards long term and i think my couple of my colleagues added that i do not have a short term view uh, this looks like a crisis no crisis stays forever Yes, it's a tough situation, but I think you're fairly well equipped, at least on the information sides of what's going on uh, to be able to do that. Uh, I hope what I have said was of, of some value. Uh, I think the colleagues who spoke before me were able to provide a lot of pointers um, and uh, I can only hope that this was helpful. I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you for being listeners and again, apologize for the IT trouble. Well, that's perfectly fine, sir. I'm sure this uh, information was quite valuable and helpful for the students who are uh, planning to uh, take admissions this year, especially given the current crisis. Now, we have certain questions. Uh, we have Amisha Savlani with us. Amisha wants to ask, what about the fashion designing uh, course in, in this uh, time of crisis? 
is it suitable and what are uh, what are the career scopes in this field of uh, uh, no field of fashion design uh, great question i think just connect with what i said uh, that uh, as long as you are interested in fashion designing, in fact, if you ask me, I was speaking to a couple of people who are in design, opportunities in design are, can you even imagine if uh, with the way, you know, the social distancing response, response has to come through, uh, how it can affect fashion in, in, in every possible way. Uh, folks are, you know, not in a funny way, folks are designing what kind of face masks we are going to wear, clothes, will respond to that uh, but i think fashion is there to stay there is nothing to suggest that but design in general uh, hotels may design their rooms differently restaurants may want to set up uh, their uh, you know covers in a different way uh, a lot of new products will come so i think uh, uh, if you are somebody who is interested in fashion stick to it uh, and you know it's just that you have to again go back to what i said uh, there are going to be more opportunities coming out of yes we have a change but the change will bring opportunities uh, and i don't see uh, you know fashion industry not responding and in so many ways uh, to the requirements that the new norms will uh, you know bring to table great thank you so much sir and uh, the next question is from uh, himanshu himanshu yadav uh, he's saying uh, is this an ideal time for taking admission in MBA program or should I wait till next year? We also have Ruchita who wants to ask, is it better to pursue economics or management given this uh, crisis uh, from the point of view of a career scope? Uh, okay. I, uh, when I was in US, you know, there was this trend. A any year where the employment scenario uh, was not that great or in other words, when unemployment numbers would grow, suddenly you know enrollments in mba programs would shoot up uh, and and the reason was that people would take a call between staying on a job or looking for opportunities that were not that great would spend that time to add the academic educational value and what would typically happen is that while they went to college or university and were doing those programs the psych the economic cycle would have moved forward uh, and suddenly the jobs are looking like they're out there uh, uh, and it would work well for the simple reason that you know if the jobs are not out there what do i do with my time now that's a, that it's easier said than done because you know we have to earn your uh, livelihoods which is where i think the blended opportunity is of course uh, fantastic uh, so my answer to you is there's nothing that should come in in the in the way of your adding value to yourself academically on your resume one and of course in terms of uh, the skill set that it offers right? and, and we know you want to do both right? when you, when recruiters look at resumes they want to look at you know what kind of qualifications you pack and the reason they do that is because they think those qualifications will will get uh, demonstrated in the skill set that you'll offer on your job so please continue to do that the question for you to answer would be that if you have a job or if you're looking at an opportunity which is available take that you could look at a blended online uh, management program so that way you could keep both going uh, so the, the choice between doing a program or not doing a program i don't think is uh, is what you should look at uh, go ahead and keep you know adding value if you're financially if you're fine if you can support yourself or if you can line up a loan uh, you could go ahead and do that anyways if you want to look at a distance program do that if you have a job uh, so, you know, do not get restricted by the fact that, oh, we, I don't know what's going to happen six months down the line to should I postpone my uh, value addition process. So if I were to, you know, limit my response, there is no reason for you to postpone value addition to yourself. Go on with it. Use the choice that works for you, but go ahead. Uh, and I think, Shitesh, the second question was about uh, whether I should do a, a program in economics. Now, again, uh, if That's you're right. passionate about economics, right, you can, uh, you know, I, I, nobody saw what's happening today. Uh, we were looking at maybe a six and a half, seven percent GDP growth rate in 2020, 21. All industries were looking at cycles which would uh, possibly make 2020 a better year and 21 a great year. Look at where we are right now. I think that's it's fantastic time for an economist to look at what's going on and everyone wants to understand what they want to say. 
if you're passionate about e economics, right? If it as a subject area, as a thematic area, there's nothing to suggest that you know you don't want to pursue that as a career. Uh, if you're not, uh, I think you can look at a more generic option, right? So the decision between going to focus programs, to my mind, is always about you know how clear and passionate you are about that. So you know if we put a put a general spin to uh, you know even hospitality management education. So we have folks who would choose just a culinary program, and there are others who would choose a general hospitality management program. And the reason, the the difference between the two categories that I always see, the ones who choose the culinary one are ones who are very clear and focused and are passionate about doing just that and nothing else. You know, and they're clear that, that that's all they want to do. The others are open to, and there's nothing wrong with either of those two. You know, you could be one or the other, and that's fine. Uh, but if you are somebody who's not very passionate about it, pick up something which is a little generic because I think then those options are open. Uh, but uh, if you are very clear and if you really love, uh, you know, what economists bring to the table, there's no reason for you to not look at it. Great. Thank you so much for your answer, sir. And now we'll, uh, so a request uh, to all the panelists, we'll, we'll quickly open uh, the Q&A section though we are we have a scarcity of time so uh, let's keep it short uh, but then these questions are open to all the panelists and uh, i would like to welcome everyone to answer these as well uh, so the first uh, question is from uh, rahul gulati rahul wants to ask uh, you know about online exams how online exams can be conducted when the student is sitting at home without anyone supervising him or her okay you want me to take that Shitej? Yes, sir. Uh, you you can start, and then our other panelists mm -hmm. would add, add on as well. Okay, I'll 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 just you know lead on uh, 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 give you a sense of how we are doing it. So what we are doing is we are running it through uh, Google Meet, uh, and what we require every student to do is to keep their uh, video link on so that we can look at them. Uh, what we have also done, and I think that my colleagues uh, would would possibly be smiling. The test is structured in a manner. You know, it's pretty much like, you know, I don't know if anyone's taken an open book exam, right? Uh, the open book exam gives you a sense of, oh, you know, I can pick up any book and, you know, this is going to be easy. Trust me, the, the way the exam is structured, if you haven't read, read your stuff, if you aren't prepared, uh, you're not going to be able to wing it. So the two parts that we do is uh, the way the exam is structured and then, of course, the technology piece. So while you're running uh, the exam and it's, you know, structured in a manner where, uh, you don't really have time uh, to look left, right, and center. Anyways, we are looking at you, and we do batches. So what we are doing is no more 30, no more than 30 students, uh, and we are doing multiple cycles of those all through the day, so that we are processing applicants. Uh, and you know that's the approach that we are taking. Uh, so you know, I hope this answers your question. But uh, the the response that I have seen, it seems to work. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. sorry. So, um, so I'm the, would you, you carry on? Carry Shadej, on would you like to? Yeah. Okay. So basically, for us, um, uh, we have a learning management system which is equipped for taking uh, multiple choice uh, based uh, uh, questions, but at the same time, our own ERP system also allows the the mechanism to be able to take the online exams at whatever numbers. So whether it is 30 numbers, whether it's 500 numbers together. And we've also very, re uh, very recently um, brought in another external system that uh, enables a lot of um, uh, proctoring as well. So I think what happens in people's minds is that, you know, is the online exam happening, exam happening properly? Is it uh, ethically being conducted? So what we've done now is we've, um, we've obviously uh, invested in, in a technology that enables that to happen. So one, the exam is happening. And at the same time, there's also the uh, artificial intelligence based uh, mechanisms and systems that are able to track what is known as a trust score, for example. Right. So um, uh, essentially this whole idea that uh, you can take an exam, that is not the, the big problem. The, the, the big problem is, um, you know, am I being able to proctor and invigilate well? So what we've now done is we've invested in a mechanism that enables us to do that. And I think it's worked uh, very beautifully for us. Great. Uh, Dr. Shivendra, Dr. Rekha, you oh, want to uh, Shivendra. Yeah, Shivendra. Thank you. Add on to that. Yeah, uh, hi, can Shivendra. I go on? Uh, Ma'am, oh, uh, let us have the answer from Dr. Shivendra and uh, then we'll come on to you. Would that be fine? Yeah, sure. 
Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I'll just uh, uh, compliment to what uh, my colleagues just mentioned that it is a combination of LMS, uh, ERP, and artificial intelligence. So uh, from 29th of this month, we are starting our examinations online, and there let there be no uh, mistake because it doesn't matter which part of the country you are as a student, we are able to see you talk to you, monitor you, uh, hear you, control your machine remotely, we can do anything we want. So if you, if there's an examination question in a, uh, on your screen, you try to browse to a different website, uh, we can see what you're doing. Uh, the crawlers will uh, automatically send an alert to us. Uh, we can control your webcam, we can control your microphone. So anybody prompting you an answer, we know that it is happening. So all those control mechanisms are there. So it's a very intricate combination of artificial intelligence, ERP, and our LMS. So the first score, what my colleague was mentioning, is a combination of it. And uh, it is no great science. We are able to do it. We are starting a regular examination from 29. And absolutely, rest assured, it is as good, in fact, much better than human proctoring on as Facebook examination. Over to you, Dr. Rekhavich. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so I will just add on to what uh, the other panelists have mentioned. Uh, even our university is uh, going on for online examination. And uh, uh, basically, yes, we are going to go for uh, AI based proctoring, remote proctoring. Uh, the students' uh, images will be verified and uh, they will be able to take their examinations. Uh, we are working on different types of question papers because, you know, the engineering uh, section will have different types of question papers, the management, the law will have, you know, theoretical based question, case studies. So we're working on that as to how to design, be able to design uh, such question papers. Uh, we'll try to incorporate all kind of strategies to do that. Uh, we are also working on training the staff, the faculty on uh, preparing those question papers and also for proctoring, remote proctoring. Uh, it is going to be almost in the same way like in a classroom we have 30 students and then an inch later so we'll be assigning almost the same number of students to an uh, a remote invigilator and they will be proctored. Uh, the continuous uh, video stream will be shown uh, for all those students to uh, the faculty, the science faculty, and uh, evaluation will be done on online. So yes, uh, we are giving enough time for the students to get prepared to such technology and even the faculty and the staff in the university to be prepared for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rekha. And, uh... A couple of students have also asked about, uh, you know, their pending board exams. Uh, no, so so some of the uh, some of them have their, uh, you know, a few board exams left, and they're also preparing for entrance examinations. So they want to ask how to divide their time between preparing for board exams and entrance exams, and how to prioritize. Okay, uh, should I go ahead? Uh, anyone would yes. want to take this answer? Dr. Rika, you can start and right. uh, you know, everybody would pitch in. Okay, so uh, so basically, since uh, the students are at home, uh, there's a lot of time in hand. Uh, it's very easy to divide the time. Uh, for board exams, yes, not all examinations are left. Some are over, some have to be you know, uh, taken. So uh, uh, the board exams are important, the results are important. Assign uh, some time for those subjects uh, and for entrance. So uh, I think uh, because there are fewer subjects less for board exams, so you can uh, allocate little less time for those courses and more focus on the entrance examinations and keep on tracking uh, when these examinations will be held. And a lot of online practice uh, websites are there where you can uh, go on preparing uh, which which area is weak, which area is strong, so you can categorize that and uh, build upon that. Thank you. And uh, any of our other esteemed panelists want to add to this? No, I think um, uh, what Dr. Vig uh, uh, mentioned is, is absolutely correct. It's quite difficult um, to keep yourself motivated in such scenarios, especially when you are uh, essentially in a lockdown where you can't do much you can't necessarily uh, you know entertain yourself too much but but i think um, this is a test for all of us 
and this is a test for the youngest as well as the oldest. Um, it will be important that you follow what uh, Dr. Rekha has been talking about, apportion time. And, um, you know, we, obviously we're talking about careers that are going to last much longer than this crisis, right? So if that should have to keep you motivated. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Vishal. Now, uh, though we have a lot of questions, but as, as I mentioned, due to scarcity of time, uh, no, we, uh, we would not be able to take uh, any more questions now. Uh, but rest assured to all the audiences that are present here, uh, no, these questions would be forwarded to the universities or shiksha.com. Uh, no, we'll, we'll try and answer your queries uh, to your content and you would receive uh, answers to all of them. Uh, I would now uh, want all my panelists to very briefly uh, no, uh, describe or mention how your university is uh, uh, prepped up and can help students uh, no, uh, take admissions or uh, through online examinations uh, tackle this crisis. So very briefly, sir. I, I, think, I, kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think I kind of mentioned that. Uh, so we, we started the process almost three weeks back. Uh, we do have a cycle of applicants that comes uh, early in the year rather than you know what some, some of the universities potentially look at the process uh, going into June and July, we, we get that done fairly quickly. So we moved to online personal interviews and online exams over the last two weeks. Uh, so it's going well. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, 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 like I mentioned, I think everyone's pretty much going to be able to line that up. Uh, what's going to be required is for students to not, you know, see this as a, the fact that you cannot physically move don't view this as a limitation in terms of making your life decisions. Go on, you know, with what you have to do. Uh, also recognize, don't spend time trying to establish whether, you know, May is going to open up or June is going to open up. I think that nobody really knows what's going to be that trend. You know, a couple of bad days in terms of number of cases and the government's not going to allow any movement anywhere. Uh, there's, there is no real logic in terms of the process also. So if you're staying in an area which is in a lockdown, right, and you're looking at an institution which is possibly in a green zone, you're still not going to be able to meet. Uh, so I think have an open mind. All the information is, is available. And, and I think the only thing that uh, an individual needs once you have potentially done the process, uh, so if you have, for example, been processed by us and you made an offer, you just want to make up your mind. The validation speak to, you know, ask us, you know, can you connect me with a few alumni? Can you connect with me, correct current few students? Uh, can I meet, uh, speak to uh, professors? If we can teach you, we can talk to you as well, right? So open mind is all that's required. Don't worry, uh, you know, maybe two months, three months down the line, things are going to be all right, but don't hold back your decision making. You know, that's the point I would make here. So said, uh, Mr. Sandeep. Yes, sir. Dr. Vishal, uh, Dr. Rekha. I think, uh... For us, uh, the BML Munjal University, it's all uh, systems as normal. Um, you know, our admissions processes are going on. Uh, obviously, a lot of it is now completely online rather than face-to-face. Uh, -face. So obviously, the uh, digital assets, the, um, the virtual reality piece, um, the showcasing of the university, the touch and feel is something that is obviously transferred online. And that's something that all universities will also have to be able to develop uh, over a period. But I absolutely agree with, uh, you know, Professor Munjal as well that uh, you know don't hold back you know this is just a blip in this whole scenario all admission process are going on in fact all um, good uh, progressive universities are giving you that extra helping hand uh, to ensure your decision making is absolutely uh, you know proper it should not be based on um, you know knee jerk reactions it should not be based on uh, short term um, uh, questions of um, uh, you know for example, uh, investment it should not necessarily be based on, but it should be based on a lot on you know, what you've always thought, careers, what you always thought, um, employability, what you always thought about making a mark uh, out there. I don't, I don't think that changes, but most um, you know, universities, uh, I know for a fact, have been able to align with the digital media, right? So you won't face any issue. Right? Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Rika. So, uh so basically, North Cap University is uh, uh, well prepared, and uh, I think the next semester date, which we 
had earlier decided as to when to start that's 27th of july we are sticking on to that unless we get some government directive that you know we need to postpone it further we are well prepared for that our this time semester is ending uh, almost on time we simply had to juggle a little bit like as in the examination had to be postponed internships had to be postponed and so on uh, but yes, we are working on that. Uh, regarding admissions, yes, the entire process has started. Uh, most of the details are on our website. If you, there's any confusion, the students can call. There's a virtual tour which they can take. Uh, I, I know visiting the campus gives an entirely different feel, uh, but unfortunately, since you cannot go out, so just have a look at the virtual tour. And uh, all admission-related queries uh, can be give, uh, taken by the admission team. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank our esteemed panelists, our honorable panelists, for uh, taking out the time. Also, apologies to this session uh, got uh, you know, uh, quite long. But then, yes, I'm sure we were able to help students, and the students have a lot of clarity at the end of the session uh, as to how and uh, how to select the universities or colleges that they dream of. And uh, we, we talked about open mind. We talked about uh, lending a helping hand to the students in the time of crisis virtual tools technology uh, and uh, no I'm, I'm sure students would uh, uh, go out smarter from the session uh, thank you so much everyone thank you for joining and all the attendees and uh, thanks again our esteemed panelists uh, thank you thanks Take so care. much thanks Take and care. thank you all the panelists it is good thank to you everyone thank you. Pleasure to meet everyone thank you thank you all Take care. Bye bye. thank you bye bye okay. bye be safe